Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this special panel discussion with Women in Focus Ultrasound, inspired by the film Picture of Scientists. I am Jessica Foley, Chief Scientific Officer for the Focus Ultrasound Foundation. Before we get started, just a couple of technical items. If your connection is lost, please simply log in again through the link that you received when you registered, and you will receive a link to a recording of this webinar as well. So now we'll get started. I hope all of you joining us today have been able to view the film Picture a Scientist. If you have not, it's a powerful documentary that shines a light on the troubling experiences that too many women scientists face that have created and continue to reinforce the inequities at play in our institutions and our organizations. And it also provides perspectives from a range of scientific luminaries on how to make science more diverse, equitable, and open for all. Our panel today will reflect on the film, including the challenges that exist in our current system, while also highlighting the many positive aspects to careers in science and engineering. And ultimately, we will try to identify ways that we can all work to improve our institutions, organizations, and science as a whole. So to level set our discussion, I just wanted to provide a few statistics to describe the landscape of women in science and engineering. So of all science and engineering degrees that were awarded in 2016, women earned about half of bachelor's degrees, 44% of master's degrees, and 41% of PhDs. For biomedical engineering, which is probably the most relevant to our focused ultrasound community, the numbers are pretty similar. For 2018, 45% of um, bachelor's degrees and 44% of master's and 40% of PhDs in BME were awarded to women. However, there's a marked drop off in the percentage of women faculty in biomedical engineering. It's really only around 20 to 23% in recent years. And we see progressively fewer women moving from assistant to associate to full professor. And of course, the numbers are even lower among underrepresented minority students and faculty. It's difficult to find the exact numbers for minority women in biomedical engineering specifically, but for overall engineering degrees in 2018, around 15% of undergrads, 14% of masters, and 10% of PhDs were Black, African American, and Hispanic, and that included both men and women. And of BME faculty in 2018, around 5% were African American and Hispanic, again, both men and women. Women make up half of the total US college educated workforce, but only about 28% of the science and engineering workforce. And although the US science and engineering workforce is becoming more diverse, there are still several racial and ethnic minority groups that continue to be significantly underrepresented. Another thing from the film, is this concept of the iceberg of sexual harassment that was put forth by the National Academies. And it describes the different forms of sexual harassment and discrimination that women experience. And the point of this is really that the obvious forms of harassment are really just the tip of the iceberg, but it's often, um, and then those are many oftentimes the only ones that are really seen and deemed to be a problem. But most women more often experience what's underneath, like inappropriate jokes, biased insults, subtle slights, like not being included in meetings where you're the expert, biases around working mothers, pay inequity. And the gender and racial biases that exist can not only discourage women from entering STEM fields, they can also limit equitable advancement for women and even drive them out of the field altogether. And so that could likely be one of the contributors to the statistics mentioned earlier, although there are likely many other contributors. Um, now, before we move into the panel, I wanted to release a few poll questions. We'd appreciate if everyone joining us can answer these, um, just to get a little bit of a better idea of who's in attendance today. So I'll just give you maybe about 30 seconds to, to answer these. Oh, we'll see how as people come in. So it's great. It looks like we have a range of career stage um, as well as the sector. 
um, most mostly women, but we appreciate that there are men on here. We it's very important to have men involved in this discussion as well. So, um, so I thank you for that. Um, so now we'll now we'll get uh, started with our discussion. So I'll ask each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves and share their own reflections on the film. And we'll then talk a little bit about the need to recognize and dismantle gender and racial biases that do exist in our scientific biomedical enterprise. Um, when preparing for this panel, several of the panelists mentioned that there are many great things about an academic career and you, you don't want the negatives portrayed in the film to discourage women from entering academia or STEM careers in general, general. So we'll definitely spend some time talking about that. And ultimately we want to end today's discussion with a call to action and some clear ideas for how we as a focused ultrasound community can work together to advance equity and diversity in our field. So let's get started. Um, so I will ask you know, each of you to just take a couple of minutes to introduce yourself, share any thoughts you have on the film. I mean, that could be if you, you know, sharing your own experiences that may compare or any overarching ideas about this, how to make you know, STEM careers more equitable, anything you want to add. Um, so let's start with um, Dr. Nicholson. Uh, <clears throat> Jessica, thank you, and um, a thank you to, to the Focus Ultrasound Foundation as well for the opportunity this afternoon. Um, I'm Wanda Nicholson. I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I also serve as the director of the Diabetes and Obesity Corps, a research corps at our Center for Women's Health Research, uh, where we focus on pursuing research in those particular areas, but also training and mentoring the next generation of women's health researchers, uh, an activity that we're very proud of. Uh, and I also serve as president of our Association of Professional Women in Medicine and Science. And this is uh, within our School of Medicine that focusing, focuses on mentoring and networking and career development for our female faculty, both our clinician faculty, as well as our PhD biomedical faculty. Um, and um, certainly has been a very, very gratifying experience in that role over the last two years. Um, let me say briefly again that um, the, the film was incredible uh, from my personal perspectives on it. And I think incredible for, from a couple of different perspectives. One, the incredible intellect and perseverance of the women who, who were showcased uh, in this film. Um, I've always uh, came from the perspective that scientific discovery and moving forward and doing research investigation re requires um, someone being focused, uh, having the perseverance to stay in the lab or to stay in your clinical research area, to really move scientific discovery forward and to make a difference for all of us. And these women certainly exemplify that um, at, at, at all levels. And I congratulate them on their successful careers. Um, I also think um, as a second point is that it, it certainly emphasizes the need to see uh, women in our fields, to see them in science, to see them in technology, to see them in engineering, to see them in medicine. Um, you can imagine um, pursuing a career in STEM, but to actually see women in front of you who are actually doing it, who are actually moving forward, someone that you can reach out and touch, someone who you can call, uh, that personal experience, I think, was very, very uh, central to my career as I progressed both as an undergraduate through medical school residency and currently where I am. And I think that this film emphasizes how important networking is both in your particular area of interest as well as as well as broadly. So I look forward to joining with others on the panelists to further explore those opportunities as well. And again, thank you for the opportunity to join the panel this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Nicholson. Um, Dr. Kanafagu. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Elisa Konofagu and I'm um, uh, in Columbia University Biomedical Engineering Department. I also have a joint appointment uh, uh, in radiology, uh, also at Columbia Medical Center. Um, I'm really happy to be part of this panel and I want to thank the foundation for putting something uh, really meaningful uh, together. Um, so um, I, I've been in the ultrasound world for 25 years now. I um, uh, have uh, uh, in the academia world, uh, I'm close to my 18th year um, as faculty. And, 
and it is uh, one of the most important things is to be able to uh, make sure that we can include uh, more women uh, in uh, biomedical engineering, but also in engineering in general. Um, so that has been one of the, not necessarily my job description, but it became part of my job description after uh, I've joined the faculty at Columbia here. Um, so regarding to this, uh, to this film, uh, which was, I thought, uh, very well crafted, um, I, I went through a few stages of uh, the beginning shock, <laughs> uh, then um, some type of, uh, you know, uh, uh, realization of uh, reality with, you know, with uh, a lot of these women having um, a lot of the sexual harassment part. Um, and then, uh, and then I, I also thought that it was uh, well crafted towards the end about how these women came, uh, came out of uh, this uh, very adverse conditions, uh, almost all of them. Uh, as, as one that stood out for me was the, the, the NASA uh, scientist that couldn't actually um, uh, go on in her career as a result of um, uh, discrimination. Um, and being having had a couple of decades uh, uh, in uh, in academia, if not three decades as a student, um, I think it's very difficult not to see that there's so many women. <laughs> um, so personally, I never had a female professor. I, I you know, I, I think I had one in chemistry when I was doing my first year undergrad, uh, but I, after that in engineering, there was just nobody. Um, and one thing that kept me going and saying that, you know, uh, very similar to what uh, Dr. Nicholson mentioned, that we need to have uh, women uh, as role models. Uh, for me, it was my aunt. I, I had the civil engineer in my family. I grew up in Greece and uh, that uh, got me going. Okay, so women, it's not crazy if you like math and physics. Uh, you can become uh, an engineer. Um, and of course, when you say that to anybody, even now, uh, I say that sometimes, uh, you know, when we have family weekends at Columbia, I say this to the parents of the, of the um, female students. And some of them say, will my uh, daughter ever get a job in engineering? I mean, there's still um, a sense that uh, there's still a lot of discrimination um, in the uh, professional world. So. Um, I think critical mass is important and I look forward to discussing how we can move forward. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shibani. Hello everyone. My name is Natasha Shibani. I am a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University. Um, my appointment is sort of a hybrid across the um, divisions of radiology and oncology as well as biomedical data science. I'm working on uh, various methods in quantitative um, imaging informatics, as well as um, oncogenomics. So my journey in focused ultrasound started in graduate school, and I still am sort of interfacing with the focused ultrasound community in my postdoc, but I did my bachelor's and PhD in biomedical engineering, and during my PhD, I got to uh, really um, dive in headfirst <laughs> into the world of focused ultrasound, and so for about six years now, I've been engaged with the community. Uh, but my journey in engineering actually started um, really when I was 14, maybe even earlier than that, when I started research in a biomedical engineering lab um, in high school. And so, um, you know, I have certainly been involved in engineering for quite some time and um, seen some of the things that the documentary alluded to firsthand. But even at the beginning of that journey, I sort of made a promise to myself that I was going to pay forward the mentorship and, and the kindness that I saw from others. And so it's been uh, really a, a part of my goal as, as a, a trainee and, and hopefully eventually an academician in the footsteps of the incredible women on this panel to um, continue supporting women in the way that I've, I've been supported as a trainee. Um, in general, I think I, I have to agree with everything that's been said. This documentary was truly incredible, and I, I, I suppose I offer the perspective of someone who's um, a lot more junior on this panel. So I can say that I found it incredibly inspiring uh, as well. And, and despite some of the, the negative things that were in the panel, that were in the documentary, and, and that I think we need to hear at the end of the day, I found it to be overall quite empowering to, to hear the stories of these women that 
I can say in a lot of cases I've idolized since the very beginning of my journey in science. And it's not often necessarily that, you know, we see a lot of these scientists and incredible people through the lens of their scientific accomplishments, but it's not often that we really get a sense for their personal journeys and everything else that came with those accomplishments. And so for that reason, I thought that um, the documentary was, was really fascinating and is hopefully going to give way to um, a very meaningful dialogue, not only here, but, but more broadly, as we're already seeing on a much larger scale. Um, so I just want to say that it's really a pleasure and an honor to be um, on this panel again with a really amazing group of, of women researchers and focused ultrasound, and I'm excited for an interesting discussion. Thank you. And Dr. Ferrara. Yeah, I'd like to also thank the foundation very much for bringing us together and for um, creating this opportunity. And I guess I'm probably the most senior person on the panel. Um, so I've been working in various areas for, you know, maybe 30 years. Um, and my journey started differently, um, I, partly because I, um, at the point that I became began my career, there were few women in science um, and few women in engineering. And um, so I initially, as a teenager, I was very interested in working more in a healthcare capacity. And I became a physical therapist as a teenager and um, then ended up with a transition into engineering. My dad was a biomedical engineer in a sense very early, and I was really inspired by him and I ended up going back to school and getting a bachelor's and master's then working in industry and then getting a PhD in biomedical engineering. So I've had somewhat of a different journey and definitely through my, um, through my um, training, there were relatively few um, women in my classes, maybe typically none um, and few women in academics as well. So I definitely have the perspective of how challenging it has been for people to get started and to see themselves as a scientist. So I do think it's really important and great that we have panels like this where there are groups of people and you can um, maybe picture yourself um, and the, the film as well that you can picture yourself as a scientist. And I then, um, I was the founding chair of a department of biomedical engineering at the University of California, Davis. and. Um, I, I um, did that for about um, um, six years as chair and then continued on as a faculty member. And I then recently, about two years ago, moved to Stanford where I am a professor of radiology. So I've um, seen a number of different aspects and as the founding chair and as a chair, it was um, a high priority of mine to have a diverse faculty. Um, I have had a chance to have leadership positions in various other realms as well, including um, uh, being part of a National Advisory Council of one of the um, institutes of the National Institutes of Health. And it was really in that experience that I realized how few women were succeeding in getting the kinds of grants that we, we call R01s, which are basic um, uh, research um, funding grants. And I became really interested in how to change that and how to make, um, create a better community for women in various areas of science and engineering. So, and since then I've been involved in starting a couple of organizations um, within various scientific societies. And also as part of the University of California at Davis, um, I was part of an advanced program that um, provided workshops on unconscious bias to all search committees and um, was part of activities, mentoring activities for new faculty as well. So I've had a lot of experiences and through those activities, I've become, I've really become aware of how many great things there are that we can do to improve the environment for young women. And I think many of us are really committed to that. And um, there's, I think now a lot of, of thought about how we can make things better and, and that we are very committed. Um, so I enjoyed the film very much and, um, and I definitely have had experiences over my career that, um, that maybe mirror the experiences in the, the film, but I can also say how far I think that we've come in, um, in 
diversifying our faculty and our student body and how many people there are like the panelists here who are really committed to helping young women um, as they move forward. Thank you all. That, that was <clears throat> that was really wonderful to hear some of your, your own takeaways after the film and then also some of your early kind of career experiences as well. Um, so, you know, some of you have maybe touched on this, but like, was there an aha moment in your career when you realized that things would be different for you as a woman? And I know Kathy's already talked about some um, experiences that led her to take action in different ways, but I'm, I'm curious if you could discuss how kind of, you know, that realization that things would be different, did it prompt you to take, take action in any way? Um, and does anyone want to jump in there? Otherwise, I'll, I'll direct that to somebody. Well, Jessica, thank you for that for that question. And I, what I would say is that I think, particularly for at least from my perspective and my experiences, um, being female and also being from a minority group, um, it can be particularly challenging at times because you are sometimes faced with trying to better understand or, or tease out sort of sort of the challenges that you're that you're encountering and um, whether there's differences here based on your gender or based on your race, ethnicity. Um, I think also being an African-American female from the South, sometimes based on my travels or where I've trained, uh, depending on where we're from, we all have di a different accent as, as well. And that's actually played a role sometimes um, in, in, in someone's perceptions of me or what I've been able to accomplish or what track I should be on. Um, I think people sort of look at my demographics and hear the tone of my voice. And sometimes you feel as though they've sort of put you in a, in what's your, an achievement box. You know, this is your level of achievement and, and your, your, your perspective on your possibilities of achievement are far beyond, beyond that box. At one point in my career, I would start my presentations by explaining where I was from and explaining my, <laughs> explaining my accent <laughs> so that I would be able to maintain people's focus on the content of what I was saying. So I think, uh, you know, there are multiple layers layers here, and particularly um, when you're looking at going into the, the, the world of science and scientific discovery and research investigations. Um, so I think that that's, that's one element that has been, has, has been a challenge for me. I, I think it, I think what it served to do though was to strengthen my resolve. Um, I think all of us have had some experiences along the way where we may have had that particular professor or someone else who was, who was senior to us who may have questioned our goal of pursuing a research career or pursuing a career in science and sort of asked us why. And um, like I said, it strengthened my resolve because I don't, you, you know, my perspective was I should not have to justify my, my goals or my ambition. And uh, was it ambitious for me to wanna to be a scientist? Uh, of, of course, um, no matter what career we choose, there's a certain level of ambition and focus that's, that's required. Um, and I was up to the challenge and I wanna encourage young women, uh, girls who are, who are looking for a research career or a science career to, to maintain their course. Um, I, I think this also lends back to uh, Catherine's comment as well as, you know, when, when, when these comments are made, people are not necessarily aware of their, you know, it's unconscious bias. And I think the, the role and the focus now that we have on implicit and explicit bias training uh, is very important. I'll also say that I think that it can't be a one-time training session uh, and that we all recognize um, our biases and have made it change. It has to be an ongoing, ongoing process. Uh, within our institutions, whether whether it's an academic institution, whether it's whether it's industry, whether it's government, um, so uh, uh, again, looking at a person as a whole person, looking at their their uh, possibilities of success based on what they've achieved so far and based on their their focus and interest um, is is what we owe um, is what we owe each each other uh, as as colleagues. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I just wanted to, you know, another thing that I think was was clear in the film was that often when we raise issues of gender or racial bias, we can receive pushback. Um, and this could be from our, you know, institution, from people in positions of power saying, you know, well, I don't see this anywhere. I don't see it at my institution. But we still want to find ways, despite that, to advance a more equitable environment. 
Um, so they are talked a lot in the film about data and, you know, is there a need for data? We talked about this um, data, which um, Kathy had actually supplied to me about the BME uh, discrepancy between PhDs and faculty, um, that kind of data. Is that, you know, the kind of data that we want or other data that would be irrefutable to help change minds? Um, and then also, are there other actions that we can be taking on our own? So. Um, maybe I'll direct that one to Kathy to see if she has any comments on that. Yeah, so I think the data is really important. I still, I, and I had shared some data with the group um, that I had pulled together on the evolution over the last 20 years of women in biomedical engineering as students, as um, faculty applicants, and as faculty. And um, I, I think really, interesting features were that the students, the fraction of students has remained relatively constant in biomedical engineering over the last 20 years. It's been um, about 40% remarkably. And the fraction of faculty has increased from about on the order of, as of a year ago, on the order of about 19% to 22% over a period of about 20 years. So really flat. And um, the last year, there was a, an increase to 25%, which was encouraging. And we hope maybe will reflect um, things coming. But the inter most interesting piece of the data that um, one of my colleagues was able to provide for the applicants for, P for um, faculty positions across the University of California system in biomedical engineering was that only about 20% of the applicants were women. Um, and that's in the recent years, in the like 20, 2017, 2018 kind of time frame. So where we're really seeing that we haven't changed things is in encouraging women to believe that becoming a faculty member is a great job. And I really think that we have the best job of all. I um, try to tell people, I think that, you know, this is an an enormously fun job. We get to work with young people. We get to explore new ideas. We get to decide what directions do we want to go? What directions do we think that science should move? Um, it's an extremely empowering and very flexible kind of job. So I think that, you know, one of the, one of our goals really needs to be making sure that people can see themselves as a scientist and can um, really understand how wonderful a career in um, engineering and science can be. Um, so I, yeah, and but I do think the data is important. It's really important that we are able to accumulate more data as to the, um, as to where the, we know that we have a leaky pipeline, but we, it's not so clear all the time where our biggest challenges are. Mm -hmm. And I think continuing to acquire those data and even acquiring those data for say um, grants that are awarded um, or you know, all of these pieces of data I think are really important for us to keep our eye on. And, um, and the, the, um, the more that we can understand where the issues are, I think the better we can craft solutions mm -hmm. to improve things. Can I also jump in here? Uh, I completely agree uh, with Kathy. Uh, data was uh, one the, my favorite part of the movie, um, where the neuroscientist was asking uh, for her own uh, for her own test about bias, implicit bias, and she was showing these images on the left and the right, and you had to click very fast to see um, you know your first reaction. Uh, and therefore your bias, uh, whether you're, you're associating men with scientists and women as housewives and, uh, and so, on for, so on and so forth. And she took her own test and she, she also was failing it. So, um, so one thing that's happening is, you know, us women, you know, we, we are first obstacle. I mean, I, I really think the imposter syndrome is uh, a lot of men have it and, uh, and a lot of women have it. But I think on the average, uh, women and um, uh, we have it. I think more. I see it um, in my students, uh, as you know, more my, my female students and my male students. Um, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but I think the fact that you cannot. What's my deal? Um, What's my deal? <laughs> sorry, I cannot talk. Like that. Wait, wait, wait. Um, What's my deal? Zoom password. I can't. 
I'm sorry, just a It's okay. <laughs> L I P P. Yeah. The COVID world. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize, but this is the life of a woman scientist at home. Uh, <laughs> so, as I was saying, uh, we forgot a password in the Google Classroom. Um, all right, so uh, as I was saying, uh, I, I think that uh, it's important to check our own bias, and I, I feel like uh, like Kathy said, you know, women and men, we evaluate them for faculty positions, and then we say, why is this, there's a gap in that CV. And, uh, you know, oh, she hasn't published that year very much. Uh, and look at the other person, whoever that is, uh, it, you know, they're very much more productive. And, and I think we have to factor in that still women are taking care of families more on the average than men, at least in the US. And, um, and we have to, uh, and this is from a personal experience, we have to be cognizant of the fact that we can't use exactly uh, the same metrics. I'm not saying to, uh, to drop the quality, not at all. And in fact, uh, at Columbia, we have a majority of female undergrads coming in. I think we're at 52% engineering uh, uh, in engineering than men. And the SAT is going up, it's not going down. So it's not like we are uh, selecting women for the sake of women. And I think this is very important to say, I think uh, a lot of us have had the experience uh, and I want to talk about a personal experience that uh, as I was the second female professor in, a, in, a, in my department uh, ever hired uh, in, a, in a faculty of 25, uh, and as I was coming up for tenure, I was told that, uh, oh, you're going to get it, uh, you're a woman. Um, and, uh, and when I looked at the data, that's important, 4%. 4% of the professors in engineering at the time of Columbia had tenure, uh, female faculty had tenure. So there is a perception that the women are, you know, are inundating engineering. Um, and of course, you know, that's not the case, like Kathy said. So data, again, especially for scientists, we understand that, we respect it. Um, we, we have to look at that uh, reality much more because there's a lot of uh, misconceptions in general. Definitely. Um, Natasha, I, I wanted to, you know, you're, you're newer in earlier into your career and we talked about, and I know Kathy touched on and Alyssa has touched on as well, some of the wonderful things about an academic career in um, science and engineering as you've decided. And, you know, for people who don't know, I mean, you're, you've been highly successful as a, as a PhD student and won a lot of awards and you're a real rising star when you've decided to continue on in academia. So, just wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about why that is. And then as we segment into the, go into the next section, we're gonna talk more about mentorship. And so maybe as you talk about that, reflect on the role of mentorship in really helping you, you know, decide to, to go this academic career direction. Sure, so first of all, thank you for your kind words, Jessica. And I have to say a lot of what you mentioned, I truly owe to the, to the foundation uh, and great deal for all that they've done to support me and, and many other young scientists in the field. Um, I, it would be unfair for me of me not to mention that, you know, I was brought up the, the daughter of two academicians. Both of my parents are um, immigrants and they came to this country with the goal of seeking out education. And I was brought up in a household where education was effectively a form of empowerment. So I, you know, my mom is a computer scientist. And so I think from day one, I sort of got to uh, experience a lot of things vicariously through her experience. You know, she was the sole female faculty in her department for over a decade at one point. And, um, you know, I, I think that my my goal of, of becoming an academician was certainly um, inspired by my parents' journeys. But frankly, the journey for me even has been very different. And, and so I've seen um, from the perspective of my upbringing that you can have balance, you can have work-life balance and that academia as a, a career path can offer tremendous flexibilities and reward. Um, but at the end of the day, I think a lot of what I owe my continuation on this journey to is um, really having the right mentorship. And when I say mentorship, I think that there's really a distinction between 
um, mentorship and what one mentor called sponsorship. So early on in, in my um, journey and research, I had a mentor who basically was like, listen, sometimes you, you need someone just to mentor you. You need them to kind of show you the ropes in the lab. And sometimes you need a sponsor. You need a person who's going to pick up the phone for you, maybe even without you asking, right? Or you need the person who is going to share with you ideas about ways to carve out your path that you couldn't even think of being at your stage. And I think that those kinds of influences are so important. And I'm grateful personally to say that I've had that both from male and female mentors. And so, you know, though we're talking about the role of women, I want to emphasize that there is a really a, a tremendous place for men in this conversation. And even though we're in a panel today where, you know, like 80% of the audience is uh, female, I, I think that, you know, removing some of some of like the, the stigma and taboo nature around having these conversations can bring everyone to a point where we're just so much more comfortable sitting around the table together and having this dialogue. Um, and, and again, I think that some of the, the mentorship that I've um, encountered today has really been with male mentors who are allies and, and fully appreciate the role and impact that they can have on their female mentees. And so I'm grateful for that, but I would really love to see it happen for so many other women who unfortunately have not had that experience, of, you know, kind of just according to my interactions with various peers. Um, so I think, you know, another thing that just really resonated with me during this um, documentary, I mean, the statistics were quite staggering in some cases, maybe I already mentioned this, but I was just quite surprised, for instance, when they showed the level of the percentages through various degrees and finally got to the level of employment that that percentage was only 29% or so among women in STEM for a particular year. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the reason that I want to go into academia and the reason I have this unrelenting ambition is it would really be a disservice, in my opinion, to the women featured in the documentary. I can say even to the women in this panel who have really carved out the pathway for, for my generation to push that much harder and, and climb the ladder even higher. So I feel like those of us in my generation kind of owe it to the people who have made so much more possible um, for us to achieve. And so I'll leave it there. And I hope that perhaps inspires anyone who's listening to, to think a lot harder about pursuing an academic path. Um, I know Wanda in our conversations prior to this, you had some, you know, real strong feelings about mentorship and sponsorship. So I wanted you as well to talk about that. And mm -hmm. maybe as we talk some more about mentorship and sponsorship, I mean, we have to realize that there, you know, as Natasha is saying, she was blessed to have, find some great mentors, but not everyone is able to do that. And there are also some biases and inequities at play there in terms of who has access to mentors or others that they can really openly talk to about their career as well as challenges that they of discrimination and things they may face. So if you could weave in your views on how institutions and organizations can help create better support structures for all women and underrepresented minorities, um, as well as this kind of personal mentorship and sponsorship. Well, I totally agree with Natasha. I think that you need mentors and you also need sponsors. Um, I think both are equally important. And certainly just to reemphasize her point about, you know, the sponsor is someone who may be sitting in a room at a committee meeting and um, maybe certainly wouldn't know you necessarily as well as your mentor, but would know of your work, uh, know of your focus, know of your work ethic and commitment and an opportunity could arise and they will certainly put forward your name as a sponsor. So it really uh, can open additional doors for you in terms of your, your positive career trajectory. So I think both are very, very important. Um, you, you know, the point about what can institutions do, I mean, I, you know, we talk a lot about uh, the pipeline or the pathway forward and, and starting with um, young girls and women early in their career and creating a path for them to, to matriculate. And I think part of what we have to do when we accept them into medical school or accept them in as, as part of our faculty is to create, um, as institutions, to create that supportive environment for them. Um, and, and, and I think that includes a couple of different steps. You know, one, as, as, as Kathy mentioned, 
uh, creating a pathway and support network for them in terms of writing successful grants um, and having a positive publication history. Um, these are steps we can take and put in place to help, to help uh, young faculty trans transition in and get off to the positive start that they're gonna need uh, and, and, and they're gonna need in order to be successful and to be promoted on time. Uh, the grants is also an important piece as Kathy mentioned, but I think also creating, you know, creating this um, group of mentors and sponsors um, for our faculty as they, as they enter. The mentorship can be a mentor who is in your particular area who can guide you, you know, on a day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month basis along your career, but also having some sponsors at the departmental or at the school level uh, who are also looking out for your interest as well as you move forward. And I think we have to recognize as institutions is that uh, this is important and a win-win all around. It's definitely a win for the faculty member. They're going to, their success is the institution's success. Uh, if they get off on the right foot, they're going to continue to publish, which is great for the institution. They're going to continue to get grants, continue to uh, present on the national and international stage. Uh, and certainly having a, a faculty member who's having a fulfilling, positive career is just, a, a, again, a positive reflection on the institution as a whole. Um, let me say also akin to that is that it's important that as we bring in faculty and help them to matriculate that this is a diverse group of faculty, that we have a diverse workforce, um, because that's how we are going to be able to keep the pipeline going forward. Uh, it, it, that's how we're going to bring additional research questions, additional insight, uh, additional higher level of innovation into our institutions. So, you know, diversity is not just, you know, I want to emphasize diversity is not just statistics on a page. It's not uh, just a set of benchmarks that we just want to reach for, for the sake of reaching those benchmarks and being able to say we reach them. You want diversity in your workforce and you want a successful diverse workforce that is matriculating and being promoted through your institution. Um, both are, the numbers are important, but equally important to that is the successful matriculation of, of, of your faculty. Yeah, if I could just jump in and mm -hmm. echo what Wanda said, um, one of the things that came out of the advanced programs, um, Michigan and um, University of California Davis was something called a, a launch um, committee for each incoming faculty member. And yeah, I had the privilege of being on a couple of launch committees for new faculty at UC Davis. Basically the idea was to have five or six faculty members, um, fairly senior faculty members from around the institution who would meet monthly with the new faculty member, ideally starting before they accepted the position so that they could be mentored in the resources that they requested and then making sure that they got those resources in a timely way as they started their career. And I, I can say that it was very, um, I thought it was very, very helpful. Um, and the, I think the faculty members who had launch committees felt it was very effective, but also it was really fun. I think that for, you know, it was just an opportunity um, to get together with my colleagues, with this wonderful young person as well. And um, it was really the highlight of the month in many ways. So I think, and, and I do think many of these activities can be, they may start out being, um, you know, seeming like one more thing, but they can be really wonderful opportunities mm -hmm. to um, bridge across disciplines and to, you know, and to help get things started. I, I can say the same about the, um, the we, we gave um, um, long workshops to all of our search committee. It was mandatory. You could not serve on a search committee at UC Davis without having attended one of these workshops. And initially we found that people, because people are always so busy, they came in and they were feeling rushed and they were you know, um, not happy to be there necessarily, but with a focus on excellence and diversity, by the end, thinking about how to build their institution, how to build their department, by the end, nobody wanted to leave with, with very few exceptions. And there were a few, but with very few exceptions at the end, people didn't want to leave. They wanted to talk about, how do we come together to, um, to create an even better institution? And how do we look forward and um, find our best new colleagues? People were really enthused. So I think there are, there's a lot of positive that can come from these sorts of um, activities, but they're, for the institution, I think they're very important and can be uh, managed in a very positive way. And, and let me just add to that too that 
um, and Natasha alluded to it. And I also am very grateful for the men who are on, uh, on this call today. Um, when I'm giving presentations to junior faculty members or fellows, there's a slide that I have that I, that I show the pictures of the mentors that I've had throughout my career. And, it, and it's mixed, uh, male and female um, mentors who were similar in age to be mentors who were older. And I really want to emphasize that um, as we reach out to women today and women faculties to say that you need to be very open. You don't wanna limit yourself. Um, you, can, you can be successfully mentored by other women faculty as well as male faculty. Um, they can be as committed to you as female faculty and you wanna make sure that you're networking broadly. Um, and I have really uh, benefited from all the mentors that I've had through the years. One of the advantages of having multiple mentors is that there, was, there were some mentors who were my clinical mentors, uh, others who were my research mentors, others who were my mentors of professionalism or taught me how to network. Um, so I would encourage women as well to, to reach broadly and really have a, men, a mentorship team and don't, li don't limit it. Just as we are promoting and talking a lot about diversity, uh, you need to look at your mentorship team as being diverse as well and not limited or think that it can only be other women, women faculty. Um, as part of our professional group of women at, at UNC, we emphasize networking very broadly. And we do have networking groups uh, and networking events among women. Um, but we're also strongly encouraging uh, women to look broadly and also to look not just within your institution, that may be someone who's your day-to-day month-to-month mentor, but also thinking uh, on a national level uh, as well, uh, mentors from other institutions who can provide insight as you move through your career. Um, I wanted to ask you, Alyssa, because when we were talking about networking and mentorship and, and you brought up um, the, the IEEE group Women in Ultrasonics, which it turns out, I think Kathy was instrumental in forming. Um, but the, the role of that group or groups like that in networking and kind of tying in with, with mentorship as well. I know, you know, sometimes it's not easy to find mentors if they're not given to you. And what, how do you, how do you do that? I mean, how can, can we seek out mentors? Is it that appropriate to do to ask someone to be your mentor? Or like, how do you, how do you go about looking for mentors if they're not just naturally in your sphere? Um, all right, so first of all, I want to say Kathy is a really great mentor, and I, I have to say that uh, I'm not, I don't want to volunteer Kathy, but uh, you're looking at it. If you have any questions, uh, she's, uh, she can definitely enlighten you. Um, I, you know, the, what, what Kathy brought up, I think, was more than six years ago, and uh, I have to say it was something that I felt, but I didn't do anything about. Um, but uh, Kathy reached out to a couple of us, I think we were five at the time, uh, at the Atropoli Atrosonics uh, uh, Symposium that happens uh, every year uh, around September, October. Um, and, uh, and Kathy was very um, uh, gracious to, to, to share, um, of course, her experience, uh, which was that uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, historically men, Atropoli, obviously, uh, Electrical Engineer, Electronic Engineers Institute, uh, mainly, you know, obviously founded and composed by men. So there was a lot of uh, already um, friendships and uh, and rituals every every conference uh, where they will they will uh, basically go and have dinner and and, and, and network naturally. And then um, and then I felt also, you know, as I was uh, going uh, more and more. Uh, into my career as a professor that, uh, you know, I felt that I was never invited. And of course you can wait for the invitation <laughs> or do something about it. Uh, so, um, uh, so Kathy said, you know, why don't we form uh, our own uh, group and no way to exclude men, actually, we, we definitely include men. Um, and uh, we formed this um, Women Ultrasonics uh, Society that is, uh, that is very strong and um, and uh, the first year, I think 100, uh, more than 100 people showed up. And the second, I think yet last year, we had more than 150. Uh, so this is a conference of about uh, maximum, I think, uh, I don't know, 1,200 people. Um, so, so we definitely uh, hit a nerve. There was a need uh, for, um, for, uh, for women and eventually also men to understand why there's no 
uh, what, what, what we can do for women to include more of us uh, in science and uh, obviously in ultrasonics in this case. And then as I was going to clinical conferences as well, so as a biomedical engineer, you, as you guys know, we delve into both these uh, worlds. Um, I was going to cardiology conferences and, and some neuroscience conferences at the end, and I was very happy to see uh, that uh, it was very well organized uh, luncheons or dinners with women, uh, for women, to let them know that there is an academic career out there for them uh, that does not uh, specifically exclude them uh, and that they can combine, combine with a clinical or education uh, uh, career. Um, so, so that part was there. Um, for me, mentors, I was not also very good at asking people. Um, and uh, I think I agree with one day uh, and, and mentors and, and Natasha, mentors and needed. Um, the, the make, I mean, this is the world we live in. It's a networking uh, world. So it's important to uh, have uh, your CV and, uh, and of course uh, submit it when you're up for, when you're interested in academic position or promotion. Uh, but it also is important to have a support network uh, that also looks out for you um, and knows what's out there, who is looking for academic faculty, for example, in imaging or therapeutics uh, that will be interested in hiring you. And this is what happened to me serendipitously. I was not really looking uh, for a mentor, as I said, but there were uh, men that, uh, uh, that uh, men professors that uh, helped uh, me uh, during my career, understanding that, um, I wanted to pursue an academic career, and they did actually step in and and uh, and and use that their network uh, to help me through it. It was not just me sending CVs in the dark. So I, I think it's important to seek out mentors if you have that personality. I personally don't, uh, but uh, and even if you don't, I think just the overall excelling and sharing your work and persevering and thinking that you're the only one out there, you're not alone. I mean, I just want to make sure. I say that because some, especially now with the pandemic, uh, a lot of students feel like that. Um, uh, you know, just do your best to 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 participate in virtual conferences and, of course, submit your work in, in publications and um, and try to network as much as possible in a in a good way. Or ask, ask, ask us, ask us how how you know what what is the way uh, to 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 do what I you know. To, do, to be able to be successful where you want to be successful. You don't have to do something that you don't like. I was also and, gonna, gonna add to that comment about the networking, particularly nationally, another um, avenue for networking and mentorship is through our professional organizations. And so the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, for example, we have fellows, but we also have junior fellows. And that particularly is focused on um, our OBGYN residents and those who are entering subspecialty fellowships so that they have an avenue to be groomed and mentored as well as they pursue careers. Um, I have colleagues who are members of the Society for General Internal Medicine and they have a women in medicine group uh, that provides mentorship and networking and, and partnerships. Um, a third group that I'm familiar with is the Endocrine Society, uh, which again has focused on women um, in endocrine medicine and also uh, really move forward with focusing on minority groups uh, who are entering the field of endocrine medicine as well. So that's another important and I think very strong uh, pathway for networking. And again, with the COVID pandemic, we aren't getting on planes and flying and, and doing this networking in person, but the meetings are continuing via Zoom. And although I know all of us have a certain amount of Zoom fatigue, um, I just wanna emphasize this is still an incredible you know, opportunity to, to interact uh, to even set up a separate Zoom meeting if you identify someone who could be who could serve as a mentor for you, even though they may be at another academic institution, as long as they're they're in your field. Um, and then one other uh, comment that I that I wanted to have, I wanted to make as well, is to just reemphasize Kathy's point about statistics. I know she made this comment a few minutes earlier. I want to emphasize that as well, how important it is for us to have data so we can see whether what we're doing is working. It may be that we have great ideas, but perhaps that particular solution isn't working quite as well as we would like. So it gives us data to look at and, and gives us a chance to step back and look and see what are some additional steps or additional problem solving uh, that we need to need to make. So sorry to backtrack to that comment, but I just wanted to follow up on Kathy's important, important work in this area. 
I was going to jump in and just one or two other points of that discussion. One is, um, as we get back to traveling again, I think it's important at conferences not just to think about mentoring, but also just to make sure that people feel comfortable. So part of the reason that we started a couple of these groups was that I know I came from a lab where my advisor was not an ultrasonics person, but I, but my um, PhD, my dissertation was in ultrasonics. And so I went to I went to conferences where I knew no one. And um, as especially in at that point, but even now, if you are a young person going to conferences and particularly as a woman where you may feel intimidated to go to evening events on your own, or you know, you go and you're in a large um, room where there's where you really know no one. So I think it's just so important for us all to be conscious of that and try to make sure that we're welcoming to people who may not come from a large um, group and may benefit from just a friendly face. It doesn't have to even be a mentorship. And uh, for anyone on this call, you know, the ability to just reach out to others and make sure that people feel comfortable is really important. And the other thing I was going to just mention, I think the other thing that's important for all of us who are trying to um, enhance diversity is awards. And um, so we will be putting a blast out from the women in um, molecular imaging part of the um, World Molecular Imaging um, Community Society, um, hopefully today, on a couple of awards, a rising star and a leadership award. Um, but I, I do think that it's important to recognize, to make sure that all of your colleagues um, are recognized for the things that they do, not just women, but including women, because so often people people just have a tendency to value what they do and what they know. And so um, people who are the most similar to them may seem like the best candidates for an award, but making sure that you're looking and your un own unconscious bias doesn't influence who you see as someone who would benefit from an award. Because this is one of the areas where I think I was very privileged to have people recognize some of the things that I did. And I think it's really important that we reach out and recognize others. This is all wonderful. And, and you know, unfortunately we only have a few minutes left. So what I just wanted to kind of try to end with is, you know, do we have any kind of clear takeaways, actions? I mean, I know particularly from the foundation, you know, we're happy to, to help the community as a whole, how we can in these efforts. So if, if we want to move things forward for the women, for women in focused ultrasound, um, you know, just some ideas, do we need a, to develop a women in focused ultrasound group? We talked on some of the pre-calls about a, a task force that could like help further discuss, um, actions that could be taken, including data collection efforts that might be more specific to focus ultrasound. Just kind of if you if you all could give one idea of, of what we could do, um, maybe more collectively um, as things to, to take with us. Uh, start with Kathy. Um, so I think there are many things a panel can be good. Another, even just a, a practical thing, having someone to help administratively with, say, putting together award nominations is incredibly helpful. I know I do a lot of these and they're time consuming. Um, so, and maintaining a database of women who can, um, and young people and diverse, um, and, and people from diverse groups and everyone who can serve as a, say, a co-mentor or a co-moderator for a sessions um, or speakers, um, maintaining those data, are, those are all important things that um, that could be facilitated. Um, Natasha, do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I certainly want to echo what's been said by just um, really reiterating that having um, a dedicated task force would certainly be helpful. Um, Kathy mentioned awards, nomination, recognition, and I can say personally, as someone who's been the beneficiary of such encouragement, it really does um, help a great deal to feel like you belong and, and should continue down the path that you're on. So I think opportunities like that would be fantastic. And we've talked a, a great deal about sponsorship, mentorship, and, and all of that is underscored by networking. So I think any ways in which the foundation can kind of help facilitate those opportunities within and outside of meetings uh, would be fantastic. And I think at all levels, we should hopefully see that people from all kinds of different backgrounds, be they in industry, academia, or otherwise, 
be they men and women can again come together for those kinds of conversations uh, down the road. Alyssa, did you have anything to add? Um, I volunteer for whatever the foundation. You volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, as Kathy said, I mean, uh, it feels like you, you know, you're getting something else on on top of your, of everything else that you have. But I think um, it's important uh, to have this satisfaction that we all feel uh, by pushing forward people who deserve it, men or women, uh, and um, and having, you know. So having a, something that really benefits a society as a whole, uh, I think having half of the population being more disadvantaged uh, in any way, uh, it just doesn't do service to anyone. So, um, so women in focused ultrasound sounds great. Um, and also holding panels uh, at the uh, biannual meeting about how, how do I, I mean, we hold those uh, on a semester basis at Columbia and they're very, very popular. How do I get my academic career going? Uh, why an academic career? <laughs> um, why not industry? Why, you know, all, or why industry over academia? I mean, oh, can I do industry before academia? Or can, and I'm sure in the clinical world, uh, you know, can I be a clinician scientist and how do I protect my research time? So there's so many things that uh, young women and men have as a, as a, as a, um, you know, as in, it's just a doubts about their future and how they can, um, uh, how can they be successful. So I think we have to provide that. It's you know, and and, and a way a way uh, through this meandering world that we live in right now. Um, and Wanda, do you have any final words? Well, I agree with all the all the suggestions that have been made, and in particular, I think the task force is an excellent idea. Um, you know, having a series of panel discussions where we invite a broad range um, of participants to talk about their research, to also offer uh, mentorship or sponsorship, having sessions around around that as well. I think all that's important to help push the science forward. Um, I also just want to say too that I think that. Um, it's, it's just incredible to have a career as a faculty member, to have a career in science. And that uh, it's just been, just, been, just been great, even given the challenges and that science is hard, but I think that's the reason um, why I've always been intrigued by it and always pursued it. I think the challenges of it have, have been what's kept me going and um, just wanted to emphasize that again as well. Great, and thank you all for sticking with us. We have just one final poll question to release now, which it kind of goes along with what we're talking about, the future things, future events, resources. So this is really, um, you know, what what might you um, in, in the community like to see more of? So I'll give you just a, a few seconds to, to answer that poll. Um, and while we're doing that, I, I just want to thank all of our panelists for this really fascinating discussion. I appreciate your insights and I look forward to further discussions with you all and others in our community as we work together to advance equity and diversity in focused ultrasound. So this concludes today's webinar. If you would like more information about the foundation, please visit our website, fussfoundation.org or email us at info at fussfoundation.org. Thank you all for joining us today and stay tuned to our newsletter and website for invitations for future webinars. Have a great day, everyone.